So the other thing I just want to check in on before we get started is that everybody has found the way to access the chat function. So I'm going to ask for some chat um, questions. So there should be a little chat button if you move your mouse probably to the bottom of the screen. Um, if you're not seeing the chat, see if you can figure it out while I go through my first couple of slides. Um, so I'm, let me introduce myself. My name is Rachel Rokeek. Um, my pronouns are she and her. And I am, um, I'm currently the manager of public engagement at the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. And I also like to refer to myself as a museum adventurer because I think more, regardless of where I'm working at any given time or what I'm working on, the way that I try to think about my work in museums is to be a little bit full of surprise and the unexpected, I'm like a, a, an adventure. Um, so that's sort of the spirit that I try to bring to my work. So what I am hoping to do today, um, I've been a museum educator for a long time and I do a lot of training about how to be kind of engaging in lots of different ways with lots of different museum visiting audiences. So what I'm hoping to do today is kind of talk through some of the ways that that might be applicable to your sessions at AAM. Um, whether you are first time presenters or whether you are seasoned presenters, um, hopefully there's something in here that will spark something new for you. Um, but I am going to try to encourage a little bit of interactivity throughout the session today too. So if you're able to try and pay attention to both the content that we talk about, but also what strategies I might be using, even on our kind of webinar format here, where we're not necessarily able to get too interactive, um, save a little bit of your brain to try and keep in mind what strategies I'm using and see if any of them might be of interest. Um, so without further ado, I will move on in. And here is where I'm going to start asking you to use the chat function. Um, so when you selected an interactive session, what was the top reason for why you wanted to be interactive? So if you can type that into the chat, I'm going to give everyone a minute or two. I'm looking at our chat. If you're joining by phone, I, I recognize that might be different, but if anybody is on the chat. So um, one person has said, oh, and, and one thing you can choose on the chat is whether you're um, sharing with everybody or whether you're just sharing privately. So feel free to use either of those. If you don't want everybody to see, that's fine. I'm not going, if someone sends me anything um, privately, I'm not going to attribute it. Um, so a couple people are sharing things publicly. Talking with people is more interesting than talking at them. I agree. Um, somebody said to me um, that they're doing a session about movement in museums, so the interactivity is aligned with the content of that session. Um, talking about being more engaging, people learning better when they're interacting. Um, active learning is more likely to be retained. Uh, more useful engagement strategy than lecturing. Um, I like seeing that people's wheelhouses already include facilitation and interactivity, so that, that is also great. Um, let's see, PD activities. So kind of testing out some of those. Oh, this is awesome. Okay, so you are all, I feel like you're, you, you are all kind of aligned with where my brain is at anyway. I, I always like to try and be interactive. Um, I sort of hit a point oh, a number of years ago where I said, I'm not really gonna do any more PowerPoint plus Q&A format sessions. So I feel like all of these reasons that you are listing here in the chat are exactly kind of the same things that I try to motivate people to do when they're thinking about interactivity. Um, so the flip side of that though, is that it can be more anxiety inducing to try and do something interactive than just to prepare a lecture in advance. So that's my next question for you is, whoops, sorry, there we go. Um, what makes you most anxious when you're thinking about leading an interactive session? So feel free to put those answers in the chat too. Time management, for sure. 
have to be kind of attentive to time in a very different way, not knowing how many people will be in the audience, engagement, which could be any number of things, right? Like, are people are going to be engaged? Are you kind of putting yourself out there to be vulnerable, trying to get them to do something that they don't want to do? People not asking questions. Oh, first timer, you want to make a good impression, totally. What if no one responds? Getting all of your supplies to the location, yes. Being afraid that despite all of your planning set up and best intentions, it may still come out as lecture and PowerPoint. Sad face, yes, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I totally think all of this stuff is important to acknowledge too, that, that as much as an interactive session can be really fun and really engaging, it can also be this like extra level of anxiety inducing. And, and that is true whether this is your first time or whether you are a seasoned presenter. Um, so hopefully I'm going to give you some, some tips today and we'll have a few more of these little chat sessions. Um, but the first thing that I want to take you through is actually a description of a conference session that I, that I led. That's a little bit of a kind of immersive session, uh, immersive description of this session. So I encourage you, I'm going to put up my next slide, I encourage you to, you know, I can't see you. If you want to close your eyes and just listen to my voice, you can. It is a photo on this slide of just one little lit candle in the black background. And I'm going to describe this session. So see if you can kind of imagine the session that I am describing while I go. So imagine. The room that you've just walked into is dark. Curtains are drawn, dimly lit at one end by fairy lights strung around the walls and the ceiling. This, the air is scented with bundles of dried herbs. An altar table at the center radiates with the warm, flickering glow of candlelight. You're invited to sit comfortably on upholstered chairs or on the floor in small circles of like-minded friends and soon-to-be friends. Breathe in and breathe out. A bell chimes resonantly and someone murmurs low and intimate through an earbud in your ear. Removing or changing almost any inequity will require persistent long-term effort. Your group of friends mulls this idea over in quiet conversation until the bell chimes again. And then the voice comes back in your ear with more words to ponder. You discuss, you hear more words in your ear, you discuss again. Eventually, your departure from the room is accompanied by music playing and a parting invitation to keep wondering. So take one more deep breath in and let it out slowly. And that is one taste of the kind of interactive session that I like to lead. But I wanted to put this next slide up to make the point that interactivity can be any number of things on a spectrum. So this image on the screen now is got the question, how much interactivity are you ready to take on? And I feel like you should feel free, encourage you to feel free to think of that in lots of different ways. And so there's a spectrum of interactivity, especially in a conference session. So on one end of the spectrum, in a box that I'm, I'm kind of labeling as basic interactivity, here are a couple of key things to keep in mind. That in an interactive session, everyone should be asked to do something, right? As you've all said, you're trying not to just lecture at them, so you should be asking them to do something. You also wanna think about creating an environment for people to feel comfortable interacting. So with that anxiety about will people engage? How can you be successful? What if people don't ask questions? Are there things you can do in setting up your session that will help people feel comfortable? And think about what those are and discuss if you have co-presenters with your co-presenters. And the third thing to keep in mind 
is that by doing this interactivity, even if it's something fairly simple on the kind of basic interactivity side of the spectrum, that you're still alleviating the kind of conference brain fog that can happen if you're just going to format uh, session after session that are formatted the same way. Right, so that hopefully doesn't feel too intimidating for any of you who have signed on to do an interactive session. And I would encourage you to think of that as one end of the interactivity spectrum. And then at the other end of the interactivity spectrum is what I refer to as an experience session. So I actually just wrote a chapter in a book that hopefully will have some copies of this book at AAM if anybody would like to buy it. But I am also going to include a link at the end of this presentation to my chapter, which is about how to create experience sessions or a few tips on them. And when I think of an experience session, I think of it as sort of the other end of the interactivity spectrum that I've laid out here. So something where the atmosphere and the feeling of being in the room is just as important a component of the session as any of the content that is being talked about. So that description that I just read you that tried to give you a bit of an immersion into a feeling was from an experience session that I led at the Museum Computer Network Conference two years ago, 2017 in the fall. And it was about slow change and how can we really value and understand the need for slow change to make some of the necessary changes that we want to make in our museums. And so while we talked about slow change, we really wanted to format the session to encourage people to slow down, to be present in the moment, to focus on relaxing their shoulders, not feeling quite so keyed up about like, need to make change now, need to make change now. And so we did all these things, you know, we, we turned off the overhead lights, we organized our chairs into circles, we had dried herb bundles at every seat, um, we used a bell chiming as a sound cue, you know, we, we made all of these choices so that the feeling in the room matched the content. So some of you are also saying that at the beginning that that was part of what matched um, what in it, why you wanted to present in an interactive session in the first place is that the content of your session lends itself to interactivity. So a couple of key things to keep in mind, if you wanna go sort of full in and try the experience session route, is that the more you commit to doing something like that, the more you also have to acknowledge that it won't be for everybody and that's okay. Um, you know, not everybody wants to walk into a conference session and sit in a small group and take deep breaths and listen to a little sound cue in your ear and talk with strangers, right? Like that, that is not what's gonna be comfortable for everyone and that's all right, right? So I think that's one thing to keep in mind is that the more you commit to doing something interactive, not everybody's gonna to wanna to do it and that's no slight on you or your planning. Sometimes people are just feeling introverted or overwhelmed or like they don't wanna reach out of their comfort zone and that's okay. So if people leave the room in the middle of the session, that happens. Try not to take it personally. Um, another thing that's really important, the more interactivity you commit to, is that you have to be willing to give up some control and kind of decenter yourself in the session. So I know people are coming to your session because you have things you want to share, and you absolutely should be sharing them, and you have expertise that you want to share with whoever shows up. But if you are really interested in kind of getting people to engage fully, the more you commit to that, the more you need to be able to let go of control and kind of make it about the people in the room more than about you. And my third tip for if you really want to commit to a kind of full-on experience session type offering um, is that it really helps to have collaborators, so your fellow presenters, um, the planning process of it becomes more involved. So this is maybe not something to take on if you are presenting with people where everybody is really busy and you're in places all around the country and it's hard to find time to connect. I think the planning and the collaboration um, is really important for an experience session. So 
just to kind of figure out where on this spectrum of basic interactivity all the way up to an experience session do you fall? Um, because in the middle of that, there is plenty of, um, you know, kind of wiggle room and you can have room for magic and imagination, as my slide now says, um, in a lot of different ways in between. So those are sort of the two ends of the spectrum. But I wanted to give you a couple of examples of other types of interactives that I have facilitated in my time. So these are a few, um, I'm showing a slide now that has three images on it. And so I'm gonna go from left to right. So on the left is an image of me smiling with curly blue hair, um, talking to a couple um, who are, it's a man and a woman who are, they both appear to be white and they're holding hands and they're looking at each other. And so my face is facing the camera and the couple is facing me. And then in the background is the kind of sloping ramps of the Guggenheim Museum, which if any of you have been to, you will know. And if you haven't, it is one spiraling ramp that takes up the whole museum and it's all white. So this image is from a program that I did in the museum last summer, which was an interactive, um, I called it a gallery encounter. And this was something where we were open late on one night a week during the summer, and we were experimenting with different ways to make the museum feel a little bit more casual and fun, like if people were coming after work and they wanted a relaxing time. So I was trying to do something that was interactive without being a structured tour kind of experience. And the way that I did it was I would approach people and I asked them if they wanted to participate in an exchange that I was doing in the museum that night. And the exchange was an exchange of words. And so sometimes they were a little skeptical. Um, and I said, well, if you want to participate, what I would need from each of you is one word about your experience in the museum today. And I actually always asked for one more word than there were people that I was talking to. So this image is of me talking to a couple. So I would have asked for a total of three different words from them. And then I wrote each of those words down separately on an index card. And they were sort of like a nice weight, small index card. And I wrote it in a nice marker and they said Guggenheim on the bottom. And then I would take that and put them in my pocket and I said, okay, and that's what I get out of the exchange. And what you get out of the exchange is a word that somebody else has shared with me tonight. And I would give each of the people I was talking to a separate index card with a different word on it. And that was it. And I kind of let them know that, you know, let this word can inspire as much or as little of your time in the museum as you would like, but it's yours to keep and enjoy your visit. And so that was one kind of um, short, casual kind of interactive experience. Um, but I think a nice example of where it was really about kind of me not being the center of it. I thought of myself as the point of exchange because I didn't want to make people be asking strangers, what do you think of your time in the museum today? But I was really only the point of that exchange. It was really more about them. So that's one image. And then the middle image on this slide is actually the cover of a zine that I made for the Museum Computer Network Conference this past fall. And I also have the link to this zine, which is a freely downloadable PDF at the end of this presentation that I'll share. And so this was a zine, we called it the Empathy Jam. So the cover of this zine, um, the em it says Empathy Jam at the top. And then the name of the zine was we made a little punny name, the Empathizine, ha ha ha. And it says that on the cover, and then it says NCN 2018. And so this one is a really great example of the collaboration process and the planning, because I had, um, there were a team of five of us who were putting this together, and along with me, so there were six total. And we, what we did was we basically planned where we made this zine of empathy building and empathy fostering activities. And then we used the actual conference session to have people who attended test out these different empathy building activities. So somebody had said in the chat at the beginning that that was what you were planning to do with your session as well. And that worked out really nicely. So we, we definitely 
planned our um, our session with some empathy building. You know, we started it by having everyone have to pick up their own chair and move it to face somebody else in the room. Um, we played a little clip from Sesame Street at the beginning of the scene that was Mark Ruffalo and Elmo talking about what does empathy mean so that we weren't sitting at a podium defining empathy. Um, we brought donuts. It was an early morning session. <laughs> Um, so that was, that was really kind of, again, thinking about what, what can we do to make a conference session mirror the um, collaboration process of putting it together. And then the third and final example that's on this slide is a photograph of a bunch of people sitting on the floor in a museum. And in the middle of them is a kind of sneaking multicolored artwork that is on the floor. Um, and it's mostly abstract, it's quite colorful, it's got kind of a grid um, background with some additional abstracted, simplified images kind of laid on top of it, but none of them are really representational. And this is a photograph from an activity that I did um, a number of years ago at the National Art Education Association conference, which was actually also in New Orleans. So this is a photograph from the Ogden Museum of Southern Art, which I highly recommend going to, and we're all in New Orleans for AAM this year. And this was something that happened during a conference, but it was actually an evening activity that was outside the conference program itself. So this was the uh, museum teaching mashup that I co-facilitated, which was really about encouraging a bunch of museum educators who were there for this conference to come to a museum and be pushed outside their comfort zones to further their own creative practice. So we had people come and we assigned them to small groups with strangers at random, and we assigned each group a random artwork. And so people didn't really have research and preparation time the way they might normally. And we asked everybody in about 30 to 40 minutes to plan a five minute activity that would engage the rest of the group with that artwork. And then we went around the museum and each small group led the larger group in this series of interactives with these different artworks. And so it was, it was very varied. Some of them were very energetic. Some of them were very quiet. Some of them were very, you know, um, some of them involved sound or movement or stillness. Some of them had us make extended eye contact with strangers. It was a real mixed bag. And some of them got very emotional and asked people to share things that um, were quite personal if they felt comfortable with it. And then some of them were very playful and, and kind of casual and just had people kind of laughing and smiling. So that's sort of a, a little bit of the range of kinds of interactives that I have done. And maybe any of that will, will have sparked something for you. Um, but I wanna just offer up um, a few general tips to think about. So as you are getting started in planning, and you know, I'm gonna give you all the benefit of the doubt. Maybe you have all planned your sessions completely. But if you are anything like me, I'm gonna guess that maybe that's not the case. <laughs> um, you still have a little while before you have to have the details of your session planned out. So as you're thinking about your planning, here are a few things to consider that may help you with your interactive and engagement strategies. So one is to think about how can you vary the group dynamics? Are there things you can do to have people accomplish something individually um, that maybe they don't have to share? That's also a nice option if people are feeling quieter or more introverted or just worn out um, and low energy. Um, can you have people do things in pairs, right? Is that pairs that they know or do you want people to pair up with folks they don't know? Can you have people do things in small groups maybe different size small groups, right? That could be breakout discussions. That could be turn to the people in the row next to you, whatever it is. And then are there things you can do in the large group that are not just sit and listen to a lecture with slides, right? And within one session, can you use multiple group dynamics? That often helps people kind of feel like something in that session is engaging to them. Um, another thing to think about is, Consider getting people to do something that involves writing or drawing or moving. So some of you said you were thinking about 
doing movement strategies, right? I come from an art museum background, so drawing is something that we talk about a lot. Um, but is there something you can get that um, get people to do that will involve a different learning modality? So in museum education, we talk a lot about multimodal learning, where people get to use different kinds of skill sets um, to experience their museum time more deeply. So how could you apply that to a conference session? Another thing on that same topic, try incorporating multiple senses, right? So, um, you know, giving people donuts in that early morning session <laughs> helped give people sort of a sugar boost that, that brought the energy level up, right? But then similarly, you know, by having the, this dark room and uh, bundles of dried herbs that people could smell or feel, that was a really different kind of use of the senses. So is there something that you could use in your session that's a multi-sensory strategy that may help you? Um, and then the last one is, ironically, put this text on a slide, but try not using slides. <laughs> um, slides are often something that is an automatic distraction to people. They will either feel like they need to document your slide or read your slide or um, you know, try and record your slide or tweet your slide. And if you are really focusing on trying to get people to be present in the moment in the room, think about not using slides or keeping maybe just one or two slides up so that people don't feel like the slides keep changing. So with all of those thoughts in mind, I want to bring back our, our chat option here. And I want to know from you, what are some of the uh, successful examples of interactive techniques that you have experienced yourself? And again, I feel like that I want, I want to encourage, like for people who are first time conference attendees, that doesn't have to be at a conference. That could be in a meeting. That could be in a professional development workshop. It could be a program you've attended. But what are some of the successful strategies that you have encountered yourself in the past? So if you can stick those into the chat. I'm going to open my chat. Okay, so collective drawing. Oh, the first two are both about drawing. So being asked to draw difficult concepts. Um, oh, so drawings that were not allowed to incorporate any text. So having to express your concept only in drawing. Okay. <laughs> some of it is sessions that not everyone attended, right? So here's some, someone who didn't attend a session, but heard a session. Um, for museum leaders where they were all just shouting no <laughs> about drawing boundaries, all right? Um, another sketching one, so scientific sketching this time, creating an action plan in the moment for what you want to do. Improv games, that's always kind of a, a way to shake people up, push people outside their comfort zones. And it's interesting because I bet some of you may be looking at this and thinking, oh, that would not be successful for me. Or like, oh, I hate improv games or drawing makes me really uncomfortable. But I think that's back to that idea that some of these interactive things won't be the right fit for everybody. But if you try multiple ideas in the same session, chances are you'll find something that resonates with people. Um, let's see. So improv games, we had uh, ideas to prototype. Right, so a session where you can do some prototyping in the moment or generate ideas to prototype or both. Um, the idea of a kind of the four corners game, right, where you have to move to a different part of the room depending on what your opinion is on an issue and then talk about why. Um, very clear instructions, that definitely helps when you're trying to do something interactive, right? So the example here is when I say go, you have 30 seconds to turn to the person next to you and discuss X. Right? Or when you hear why, bring it back together. Okay? Human spectrogram. Yeah? So like if you have to kind of move to different, different um, places on a spectrum and then you kind of see where everybody in the room lines up. So these are all great. I feel like I'll, I want to go to all of your sessions now. <laughs> um, and, and I would encourage you to think about, you know, it doesn't have to just be one of these, you could think about incorporating multiple ideas in here, but you can also think about just incorporating one. That's okay too. <laughs> so what I'm gonna try to do is actually fill in, so I'm gonna um, 
get out of my, let's see, can I get out of my presenter mode? Yes. And I am going to actually fill in some of those examples that you just provided onto this table. And then hopefully this table can be sort of a shared resource. So we had human spectrogram, we had four corners. I'll put this back up in a minute. Um, we had improv games, we had clear instructions, we had drawing concepts without words. Come back and see what else we put in. Um, prototyping. I'm switching between windows, so forgive me for a moment. Um, prototyping ideas. Collective drawing. I'm just making sure I don't want to um, skip anybody. Um, collective drawing. We have <laughs> shouting go. <laughs> shouting. So while Rachel and yeah. um, uh, just a quick check in with everybody, we will have time for questions at the end specifically. And if you want to specifically share the idea that you're going to have for your session or advice that you'd like um, about how Rachel or I, and I realized in the beginning I did not introduce myself, I'm Product Community Director of Meetings and Events at AAM. Uh, and I'm also with my colleague, Tiffany Burns, who is um, our conference manager uh, for education. And many of you have talked to her a lot as well. But we will stay on and offer any advice or help that we can give to you um, as you are preparing your presentations as well. So just wanted to let you know what we have coming down the pike um, uh, towards the end if you're, you're wondering about specific things for, for you. So with that, I'll go back on mute, Rachel, and hopefully you've got enough time there to, to answer everything in. Yep, we should be good. So I, I just added those in. So now hopefully this slide is showing you a little more fully filled up um, set of different options. And I had the, the one that I um, included at the beginning, that was my kind of first sample, was something that I have, um, I encountered actually first at an AAM session and have now started to do, um, which is to have everybody write themselves a postcard with one takeaway at the end of the session, and then collect those postcards and mail it to them later. So they can address it to themselves right there in the session, and, um, and then, you send it to them. And it's always a little treat to get it in the mail later on. Um, so you all just came up with a very nice array of, <laughs> of interactive sessions, uh, session ideas. Um, I want to make sure, and as Veronica just said, that we also have some time if you all are having questions, um, that here is a chance for you to ask questions. Are you struggling with coming up with interactive ideas? Or if you have ideas that you want to bounce around with the group, we have some time to do that. So here's the part where you get to unmute yourselves and share any questions that you might have. Veronica is also suggesting, just so we don't have everybody chiming in at once, if you can send her a private note in the chat to AAM Zoom, then she can unmute you. Yeah, and for those on the phone, um, I will uh, unmute the phones in a couple of minutes. And if you have something, I will uh, leave your line open. Just identify yourself, and I'll leave your line open and then go back and mute everybody else um, so that we don't get a lot of background noise because it's kind of hard for me to, to know if you have questions if you're not on the actual um, uh, chat. So phone people, don't worry, I will come to you. We're gonna see if we get anything um, submitted to us in the chat, and then I will uh, come, come over to the phone. And, and I can also, I'm gonna read out, so if anybody types things into the chat, so um, Leonardo just added a question in the chat. Do you have any idea about how many people might participate in each session? And I feel like this is a really common thing that comes up where it's really hard to know in advance how many people are coming. I don't have, a good way to know that and I actually have a recommendation for you for any of you um, is to actually plan with a couple you know like plan A plan B plan C what happens if five people come what happens if 15 people come what happens if 35 people come 
and to have some variations um, that you have talked about with your co-presenters or are ready to go with in advance. Because I think that the thing with these conferences is people don't necessarily have to sign up for the sessions in advance. So it's hard to know ahead of time how many people are coming. So I would just recommend, especially if you're doing interactive session, to be ready to go with a few different options. Um, and that will hopefully make you feel a little more comfortable that you have prepared for a few different options. And then also be able to um, kind of change up the room if you need to or adjust your plans on the go, which is also really important that you try to not be too rigidly attached to one particular plan and to be able to go with the flow no matter what you have planned in advance. And then just piggybacking off of that, um, I think a general question of what what can you expect? Um, this is a very interesting audience for me because my background, not everybody came to the session. What I think is really interesting at AM is everybody actually goes to the session. Um, so a general range that I can give you um, as to what the room can hold uh, will probably be helpful as well. That doesn't mean you'll necessarily get that many, but at a minimum, your room can hold about 125 people. At a maximum, especially for those people that are scheduled in very large rooms, um, anywhere from 350 to 400 people. Um, and there's a couple of sessions that have happened repeatedly over the past couple of years that we have data on and we know that session in particular brings us a lot of people. So example, if we have anybody on the phone from mistakes were made, you typically get 400 people that attend that one. 31st annual um, exhibition excellence award, generally gets around 300 people. Um, so depending on the room that we've scheduled you in, you can expect a range of 125 to 350 people, depending on the track and topic that, that you're, you're in. And I think that's important to think about too, that you know, if you wanna do interactive strategies that literally involve everyone in the room, that's gonna be very different strategies for a session that has five people in it to a session that has 400 people in it, right? So I think that that is also a good thing to keep in mind is not to get too set on one particular plan because you may end up with quite a large session, even if you haven't planned for it. So I don't have any other questions in the chat yet. I'm gonna go to the phone and if you're on the phone, I'm just gonna unmute your line and see if you have a question and then I'm gonna mute you and then I'm gonna go back down the line. So I'm going to start with the first person. All right. Hi there. It's Veronica. You are unmuted. Um, and this is the uh, 202 number that ends in um, 6,700. Oh, uh, I think that's me. My name is yeah. not Veronica. So. Yeah. Um, hi. The only question I have is that, um, so my group, we're, we're doing three sessions, and I think uh, most of us are first timers. And we probably, uh, miscalculated which session should be the interactive one. Is there any possibility of switching things around? Sure, and um, this is Veronica. What is your name? Uh, my name's Leora Mervish. Great, um, Leora, Tiffany will contact you after this and we will figure out which session to, to put you as interactive. Oh, wonderful, great. Because, I mean, we have one session that would really work. Now that I've seen what interactive is, it would really work for that much better than the other. So I'll shoot her an email then. All right, thank you. Great, all right. I'm going to the next person with a um, 215 number. I'm coming to you next. Hi, it's Veronica at AM. Do you have a question? And it, it's totally okay if you don't. <laughs> nope, okay, moving on. Coming to uh, somebody with a 317 area code. So I'm going to unmute you now. Hi there. Do you have a question? I do not. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. 510 is next. And I think we may have lost that person. Oops. Do you have a question? Looks like no. Uh, Rachel, looks like there is one in the chat, chat room for you. Yeah, so um, I'm, I want to bring up this one that um, Zoe has asked in the chat, which says, 
Any tips for quick transitions between interactive experiences? For example, turn and talks can become extended chat sessions. We're hoping to demo three different programs and want to be really mindful of time. So that's definitely an important thing to keep in mind. Um, I have found that it's very helpful to have a fairly loud audio cue and uh, play that into the microphone, right? So we haven't talked too much about accessibility, although I think Veronica mentioned a little bit at the beginning, there are some really good resources in the presenter center about making sure that whatever you're doing is accessible and there are people registered who are deaf or hard of hearing, maybe relying on American Sign Language interpreters. Um, so anything that you are doing, if you're speaking, please do speak into microphones. If you're playing an audio cue, please do play it into the microphone. Even if you think you're loud and teachery, still do it into the microphone. Um, and so that would actually be my recommendation. So um, it, it's sort of a, a combination. You do need to give people a heads up, or you don't have to, but I find it's helpful if you give people a heads up in advance that you are going to be monitoring time and you are going to be playing a sound cue that sounds like, and then you can play the sample of the sound cue so that people know what to listen for. And that tell them explicitly, you know, like we talked earlier, somebody mentioned in the chat about very clear directions are helpful. And being explicit about what you're gonna do, you can say, you know, we're hoping to demo three different experiences for you. And in order to do that, we're gonna keep an eye on time and really keep on moving. If you wanna keep chatting about any of these, you're welcome to do so in the hallway after the session is over. So I hope that helps, but I, I feel like usually then you need to, you know, sometimes you may need to play your little audio cue twice, but that is usually helpful if you kind of foreground it and set up the framing um, explicitly that you're going to transition with that audio cue and then use the audio cue through the microphone. Um, and and then, as, as Rachel said, in being, being uh, uh, mindful of accessibility, you can also use a visual cue if you are not using a sound. And I've been in a session that used like cute puppies or kittens or something and that it would, you know, they would, they would transition to, a, to, to that image on the screen and it was, you know, attention getting enough that people would stop what they're doing so that, that we could come back to um, together as a group and continue on to the next uh, activity. So just Definitely. another option. And, and I would encourage you to do both at the same time, right? Because you may have people in the room who have different accessibility needs. So it's always a really good idea to have both the audio and the visual cue, um, just in case. Uh, and then there was another question that came up in the chat. Um, that says, what do you all think about using tech as a tool for interaction? For example, Nearpod, Slido, or Kahoot. Um, I actually thought about using Slido during this session. I've had pretty good luck with it. Um, the one thing that I will caution is just to make sure that you're testing. I haven't used Nearpod or Kahoot, so I, I can't speak to those. Maybe somebody else wants to chime in in the chat if you have used those. Um, the one thing I will just caution is that there's going to be a very wide range of people's familiarity with and the ability to use tech in the room, right? So like the Wi-Fi should be there for sure, but you know, if you're using something that like absolutely will not work if somebody's device has a hard time connecting, you know, if you've got a session with 300 people in it, someone's device may have a hard time connecting. Um, or if you want to project, like I have found Slido can be helpful if it's um, something you are then projecting and you can talk about out loud so that even if people are not visually able to see the slides um, or the results, you are able to describe them. So I would just say, um, I, I think you can definitely use tech in a, a way to help interaction. Um, I would just be mindful of not relying on it completely and how are you going to make it kind of adaptive to different people's um, abilities and needs. Does anyone else have I'm any head, um, I'm gonna oh, head back to the phone yeah. for, for two, um, two more just to see if, if they have questions. If I didn't get to you on the phone today because we have everybody on mute, just send me and Tiffany uh, an email and I'll, uh, I'll say it out loud at the end um, and we can follow up with you on that. So I'm coming to a 718 number uh, just in a second. Hi there, do you have a question? No questions for me, thank you. Super. And then last but not least, uh, 510 number, and I think I was, I tried to do this one before and uh, it disappeared, so. Hi there, do you have a question? No questions at this time, thanks. Great. 
All right, I think I got all the folks that were calling in that aren't also in uh, the chat. Great. So then, the, actually, this is our timing is really good. So I have one last question for you, um, which is, let's see, let's go back to my slides, which is, what is one interactive strategy from this session that you found exciting? So this could have been something that people brought up or that you heard about or that I talked about, or that we did during this session. So feel free to put that into the chat. I will read them out. So somebody said, um, I like the postcard idea. So I think that's, that's one of the things that I like about that is that it's, um, it's not that intimidating for people. It is individual. They don't have to put themselves out of their comfort zone too much. It's really um, a reflective thing on their own. Um, so somebody else said um, a board game style interactive, all right? So you can do kind of making it fun. Um, someone else said, I love the idea of centering through breathing at the beginning, right? Okay. Uh, someone else said, I totally forgot about an activity I have done with some of my interpreters that involves moving around the room. I'm gonna use that in my session. Um, Someone else said, I like the Guggenheim example, sharing different perspectives with no ability to judge. So when I was kind of trading words around, um, someone else is seconding the postcard idea, they're gonna do it. And I feel like that's, that's the other thing. So I will also share this slide presentation um, with Veronica and it now has the filled in chart with all of these examples that you all came up with. Um, so hopefully that will also be able to spark some ideas for you. Um, and this is my last little slide, which is a list of resources for interactive sessions. So a couple of them are things that I referenced during this presentation. So one is the, um, the PDF of the chapter that I wrote for this book um, about building experience sessions. So it has those suggestions from me about you know, collaborating and centering yourself and um, understanding that it won't be for everyone. Uh, so there, there is a link to that, um, which I can read out for anyone on the phone. I just made a bit.ly link. It's just to a PDF in my Google Drive, but it's um, bit.ly slash 217, lowercase s, lowercase g, capital P, capital P. I will also share this um, with Veronica so that she can put it in the presenter center. You can have access to it. Um, and then the other thing that I have linked here is a PDF downloadable version of the zine with the empathy building activities that I mentioned having done. So that is, I mean, we really, we made it with the idea that people could use it in empathy building um, sessions that you all are doing. And I feel like we're in a, a moment in the world that could use an empathy in more <laughs> and more situations. Um, and then the, the third thing, which is actually at the top of this slide, at top, uh, the top of this slide is um, a book recommendation, which is Priya Parker's book, The Art of Gathering, which came out, I think, last year and has become sort of my Bible for creating interactivity. And she really talks about, in a, it, and it's not specific to conference sessions, but I have applied it to tours in the museum. Uh, you can apply it to your own dinner parties at home. It certainly has things that I think are helpful for um, thinking about conference sessions and really focusing in on why you're gathering. That's kind of her her main point is why are we gathering and to create a purpose and a focus and really kind of clearly frame why you're gathering. So those are my three recommended resources. I think Veronica's got some um, reminders to put on the screen in our last few minutes. So I am gonna stop my screen sharing. And Veronica, if you've got other stuff that you wanna share, go for it. There we go. A couple of important Muted. <laughs> yeah, talking, <there> <laughs> talking to myself. <laughs> now we hear um, you. So yeah, just before everybody goes, um, some reminders I talked about in the beginning. Um, uh, just make sure that you register for the conference by April 19th before the price goes way up. 
Um, this recording will be available in the Presenter Center by the end of the week. I'm going to uh, type up a transcript of this uh, at the end of the week, so happy to put the slides in there, but if anybody's looking for the tester or um, needs to see it because they um, can't hear it, I will type really fast and get it to you by the end of the week. Uh, and overall, if you're planning on doing slides, they are due to us in the Presenter Center on May 10th. We'll send some follow-up emails to you all in the next, in this month's uh, speaker newsletter that you'll be getting in the next week, um, and then some know-before-you-go information as we get closer. If you have specific questions about your session that we didn't answer today, um, both of our contact information is on the screen, Tiffany and I. Um, Tiffany, is there anything you want to, to add? No, I think we're good. Um, we have all the reminders that we need, and I'll start getting um, some, you know, like you said, emails with um, additional information about those. Super. Well, I don't have anything else. Rachel, do you? Um, I, I don't. I would just say I, I put my contact info on all of my slides, but you are also certainly welcome to reach out to me if you have anything that you think might be helpful. Um, I'm just ropeek at gmail.com, which is R-O-P-E-I-K. You can find me on the internet. I'm not hard to find. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, and we will see you in New Orleans in 39 days. Not that anybody is counting. <laughs> and I look all right. Have all of your all of your fun interactive sessions, which I will try and come to as many out as I can.